That's awesome. I can walk around like this. Um, the, uh, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Maybe you can convince someone to hold off posting it for a, for a few days. 
<laughs> All right, if there's no other announcements, let's go ahead and pray for our children. Oh, Lord Father, I thank you for the laughter you've given us. You've blessed us with so much. I just can't begin to thank you for everything. I especially thank you for our children, the love that they have for us. I ask that you just teach us to be better teachers for them so they grow in your ways. So they don't ever leave your knowledge or your wonderful safe arms. I pray for the children's servant and Casey's servant. Let your words be spoken. Let your lessons to be taught. Your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. Children, you're welcome to come forward. Please sit on the floor in front of me, please. <coughs>
my toy. And he said, that's what you were seeing. You weren't seeing a monster at all. And you know, I thought about the things in the Bible, and I thought about da David and Goliath. I thought, I bet those people, when they saw Goliath over there, they were scared to death, and there was a little old David, and he thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to call on the Lord. And that is a big old monster man. And the Lord said, get some stones. See that little stone I picked up there? And he got some. And he made a molehill out of that monster there. He just cut him down. You remember that story, don't you? Yep. Did you know that God is in the business of making molehills out of mountains? And when we have things in our life that just seem so big and scary and everything, who are we supposed to go to? God. 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 We're supposed to go to God. And God will help us to conquer that thing in our life that's like a mountain. There's been a few mountains in my life, and you know why? I've lived almost 88 years old, and I'm still alive. They haven't got me. Amen. Everything that's come up that looked like a mountain to me, where is it? It's behind me. It's gone. It's just a little thing now because God took care of it. Isn't that wonderful? We thank God for that. Now Wayne's going to come and pray for us. Let's go to the board. Father, we come to you. We thank you for another wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, for the teaching from Joanne. Help us, Lord, to remember that you're in charge. Things that we think we're in control of, why do we worry about it? And things that we know that we're not in control of, why do we worry about it? Just let you take care of it, Father. We thank you and we praise you. You are so wonderful and good to us. We thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Have a good day. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> How was your Thanksgiving? You didn't eat too much, did you? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Marilyn brought chocolate. Now she brought chocolate, and then she left and left the chocolate. Oh, man, that was good. Got to go into chocolate. Now, the turkey, the ham, all that stuff, eh, chocolate, that's the, that's the leftovers. Thanksgiving leftovers. Do you like Thanksgiving leftovers? We were talking about that yesterday with some folks. You like leftovers? I'm all in favor of Thanksgiving being pizza. So then we could have pizza leftovers the day after Thanksgiving. I guess nobody actually does pizza for Thanksgiving. That's too bad. I wanted to tell you all a story this morning. We're going to be talking about who are peacemakers. Uh, this will be the last sermon that we're going to be talking about, the Beatitudes. Uh, I'm going to kind of go a little bit out of order. We're, we're taking the, the second to last Beatitude today. We've already talked about persecution. Um, so I want to talk about peacemakers today. But I have a story to tell you. And, and when, I, when I put up a picture, some of you are going to recognize a picture that, I've, that I'm showing you. If you're a certain age, you're, you're going to know probably who that is. But if you don't, it's in the story. So let's, let's see if you all recognize this, this person. Samantha Smith. Anybody recognize who she is? Oh my gosh, I didn't catch anybody. Samantha Smith, in 1982, was a 10-year-old girl who lived in Maine. She was living in Maine, and that year, the leader of the Soviet Union passed away, and another leader, uh, and Dropoff, was nominated to be in charge of the, the Communist Party, in charge of the Soviet Union. And in May of that year, Samantha Smith, this 10-year-old uh, fifth grade girl from Maine, writes a letter to the leader of the Soviet Union. Now, i gotta got to... Give some of you a, a little context of Soviet Union. 
See, Jaden's over here. She may not get that whole Soviet Union thing. 1980s, Cold War, big Soviet Union, uh, uh, communist country with the United States. This was the time of the Cold War. The, the Russians then, the Soviets, and the Americans did not get along very well. And when Andropov got to be in charge of the Soviet Union, Samantha Smith was worried. She was scared. She had heard that this man had been in charge of the KGB. The KGB, of course, was, was their spy agency for the Soviets. He had been in charge, and he was actually in charge of putting people in prison in the Soviet Union, locking them up, and he actually used mental hospitals, psychiatric facilities, to lock away people who disagreed with the communist government at that time. And so when Samantha Smith heard about and drop off being in charge of the country, she was worried and she wrote him a letter. You can see her letter here on the picture on the side, but I got the text of her letter. She doesn't send a very long letter. She says, my name is Samantha Smith. I am 10 years old. Congratulations on your new job. I have been worrying about Russia and the United States getting into a nuclear war. Are you going to vote to have a war or not? If you aren't, please tell me how you are going to help to not have a war. This question you do not have to answer, but I would like to know why you want to conquer the world, or at least our country. God made the world for us to live together in peace and not to fight. Sincerely, Samantha Smith. Anybody re remember that now? Samantha Smith? Little 10-year-old girl writes this letter. It gets published in Pravda, the big Soviet newspaper there in, in Moscow. And Dropoff learns about it from the newspaper. And about, oh, nine months after she writes this letter, he invites her to come to the Soviet Union. She actually leaves with her family, leaves the United States, flies to the Soviet Union, and at this time, Andropov was, was a very, very sick man. He only had the job there in charge of Soviets for about a year and a half. So when she showed up, she did not get to meet with him, but they sent her to uh, an international school there in, in the Crimea and showed her what it was like to be a Russian child. And of course, the media ate this alive. This was before Facebook, this was before Instagram and all those things. So this was, you know, Walter Cronkite kind of, you know, CBS Evening News stuff. And she was on the news for weeks and weeks, how she traveled, how she, she went from place to place in Russia, how she was in this special school. And she became known as the youngest ambassador of the United States. Now, of course, there was nothing official about Samantha Smith. Um, but she comes home in, in, in great fanfare. She's a very famous little girl. She comes home, and she actually, at that time, was the first kind of cultural exchange between the two countries when they really were not having much of, of anything to do with each other. About the time that she showed up in Russia was, of course, when Reagan coined the phrase evil empire. You're probably familiar with that phrase. Uh, things were not well between the two countries, but she traveled there and started this, this cultural exchange where other American kids followed in her footsteps and traveled to, to the Soviet Union. Other kids from Russia traveled to the United States and got to go to school in the United States and, and kind of see what, what we were about here. She became the youngest literal ambassador of the United States, Samantha Smith. And so today we're going to be talking about peacemakers. Samantha Smith is a peacemaker. And of all things that Jesus talks about peacemaker, he talks about being a child. If you got your Bible, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5. This is the Beatitudes, this is the last one that we're going to be talking about. So this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus is talking and he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now Samantha Smith was a peacemaker. She brought together two opposing ideals, philosophies, two, two opposing governments, and she actually bridged a gap between them to kind of get to know each other. And yet, she was not an official. She was not, you know, some adult official from the United States. She was just a 10-year-old fifth grade kid from Maine who did this all on her own without any guidance at all. She just decided to do this. And here she was, a child. So I wanted to kind of talk about that today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What is it to be called a 
child of God. Well, child of God is referring to you all. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you've given your life to him, Scripture time and time in the New Testament calls believers children of God. Let's look at some of those verses. In John chapter 1, verse 12, if you've got your Bible, you'll flip over to John. John 1, 12, he writes and he says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus is talking about being children of God if you trust and believe him. And John references that. He talks about that in his introduction to his gospel. But John is not the only one that, that takes that theme. Paul writes about that same idea in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, Paul writes and he says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And of course, Paul is writing to the church, the believers in Galatia. And so he's saying that the believers in Galatia, the, the believers in Jesus, were to be called children of God. And it was because of faith. And of course, that's Paul. Paul's big theme is faith. John takes it up again in, in his letter. And in my Sunday school class, we're going to be talking about this um, in the next few weeks. We're looking at 1 John right now. But this verse comes from 1 John chapter 3. This is the last one that I want to reference about children of God. John writes and he says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children. Because they don't know. John says that we are called children of God. But yet people don't recognize that. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Jesus' beatitude said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. John's writing about being able to recognize that we are children of God. He says, But the people who don't belong, or people who belong to this world, don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. What is it that we are supposed to do? How are we supposed to conduct ourselves? How are we to live our lives so that we are recognized as children of God? It says here that the world doesn't even know God. And yet we're called to be ambassadors. That, that children of God kind of puts us in a, an ambassadorial role, kind of like Samantha Smith. That, that we are the bridge, we're, we're the, the cultural exchange between God and man, between God and, and, and people that, that are our, our sinful, fallen world. How are we to live our lives if we are that ambassador? How are we to live our lives if people are, first of all, going to recognize that we're God's children, and most importantly, recognize who God himself really is? Well, one thing that Jesus talked about in his Beatitude was he says, Blessed are the peacemakers. So my question is, are you a peacemaker in this world? Are you a peacemaker? If you are a peacemaker, if you're that ambassador, kind of like Samantha Smith, then you are representing God's love in this world. Let me show you something. Matthew starts off the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, he writes about that, he writes about Jesus' words. But then he goes on and he, he quotes Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And right after the Beatitudes, Jesus talks about this idea of showing love to people in a special and unique way that just seems so foreign to the way the world works. Take a look at Matthew chapter 5. If you've got your Bible, uh, flip back to, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading a couple of verses from there. Matthew chapter 5. This is kind of the beginning of the, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is making a, a course correction here. He says, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Now you know when he says, You have heard that our ancestors were told. He's talking about the Mosaic Law. He's talking about Israel and the Exodus and receiving the law from Moses. <clears throat> Ten Commandments, do not murder, right? But Jesus doesn't stop there. 
He adds more to that commandment. He says in 22, But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Have you ever been at a, at a checkout counter? Been at Walmart or, or someplace and, and you're trying to, to pay, you're trying to, to get your change back and, and they shortchange you? Mess up your change? Are you ever tempted to use that word right there that, that Jesus is talking about? You ever call someone an idiot? They, they messed up your change. Or maybe you're driving and somebody pulls in front of you. I just heard a story today about how, how somebody was, was, was driving and not being able to merge. Somebody gets in your way. Do you ever let those words come out of your mouth? Jesus is saying that even calling someone an idiot is just as bad as murder. That's a high standard. I hate to say it, but there could be some pretty stupid people in this world. From day to day, you, you're bound to run into someone who is just not doing things the way that you think they should be doing it, and you might feel a little animosity about that. And if you say something about that, Jesus is saying here, if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. If you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Even just that thought, that idea of looking at somebody as an idiot is enough to be equivalent with murder in the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law. So how in the world are we supposed to live our lives? Well, Jesus goes on in the, in the next few verses, 23, he says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. What about this morning? Is there someone that you have a, a disagreement with? Someone you've had words with before you even got here this morning? That's a difficult thing. Is Jesus saying that before we can, can come to church, before we can worship, we, we literally don't have the, the temple that he's referring to and the altar that he's referring to, but, but we have our, our, our churches today. He say, is he saying that before you can go to church, before you can come to your worship time, that you have to clear the air with anybody who has something against you? Man, that's a high, difficult standard to attain, don't you think? Connie Strain told me a story one time how a, at First Baptist... Uh, they were doing, they had a special service. And before they could even continue doing the service, her daughter went and told someone, some other woman from the church, that she is sorry. And they actually had a feet washing ceremony at that time. And she washed that person's feet. Before she, they could continue, before she could continue in, in the service and, and doing the other special things with that plant, she actually got down with the water and towel and actually, not, not figuratively, she literally washed her feet in a sign of, of just wanting to be forgiven. Or whatever, whatever was going on between them, I'm not even sure what the problem was. But Connie's story makes me think about what Jesus is saying here. If we have someone that we have something against, Jesus is saying, before you come and worship me, you have to make that relationship right with that person. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. We can come to, to church and, and we, can, we can sit in our seats. We, we can even stand on the stage. 
and you get those churchy kind of answers. You know, people come up to you, how are you doing today? How are things going? How's your week? And you get kind of the same responses. Fine. There's a big churchy word, fine. Well, what does fine mean? Does fine mean good enough that I don't want to tell you the whole story? <laughs> does fine mean everything's great? Leave me alone, go to the next person? We're, of all places, a church, it seems like sometimes this is like the least open place that we are around people. It seems like when we come to church, we want to put on a facade. We want to put on a face. We want to, to play a role. We want to play a part and make it seem like we have it all together. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm that righteous person. I, 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 I'm, I'm clean. I, I'm not, I don't have any problems in my life. When literally, that can't be true. It can't. Yet we're so closed at times that we don't want to talk to folks. We don't want to open up and say, you know, I just got that diagnosis. I was just at the doctor's office, and it's just beating on me. Or, you know, my son just got arrested, and, and I don't know what to do. Do you ever come to church and hear those kind of responses when you say, how are you doing today? How's your week going? We don't share those kinds of things, do we? At least, I don't think we do. Well, maybe I could be wrong. We always want to make it happy and oh, you know, fine, fine. That's probably our favorite church word, fine, on Sunday morning. Everything's fine. But Jesus is saying, if you've got a problem with another person, before you even come to be part of that congregation, before you even come to worship me, You've got to fix that. And yet we're kind of closed off to that idea. We're not very open people. To be, to be believers in a, in a God, to be believers in a, in a sacrifice of Jesus, to, to accept things that we have not yet seen, we're kind of closed off and, and, and don't talk to people in that way. But Jesus is saying, you've got to leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. means you got to open up. you got to ask forgiveness. And sometimes the hard part is you got to give forgiveness. Sometimes that's, that's even harder than asking for forgiveness. Being a giver of forgiveness means that, that you let that hurt go. And, and, and I, I bet there's people that, that like to, to keep that hurt. Has anyone ever, you know, said something wrong, you know, criticized you, said something you didn't agree with, something you didn't like to hear? And so you feel that when the time is appropriate, it might be time to remind them in, in maybe not such a nice way of how they hurt you. That's kind of a human characteristic. That's a human trait. We like to, we like to let people know if they hurt us. And it might not be in a direct way. It might do it in an indirect, kind of passive-aggressive thing. But Jesus is saying here, go and be reconciled to that person. Jesus doesn't give us that option of that passive-aggressive, criticize people, remind them of their faults. Jesus doesn't do that. If Jesus did do that, do you want to be in that list of Jesus reminding us of our faults? Do you want to be part of that list of Casey? I know what you did back in 1978. You told your mom that you went and you fed those cows when you know that you didn't. You were out there playing with your friends. You lied. Or do you want to be on that list? Well, I saw you cheating on that test. You were looking over there at your neighbor's paper, telling your teacher that you studied, but really you were over there getting answers from your neighbor. We all have those little things that we don't want to be reminded of. That, that God and his sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on that cross, covers us. And we don't want to be reminded of it. But yet Jesus is saying here that with each other, we need to address those things. Yes, we need to forgive and, and be forgiven, but that doesn't mean ignore. Forgiving is not ignore. Forgiving is addressing. 
not just cover it over. That's a hard thing. This week, I want to give you some homework. Uh, last week I talked to you about Thanksgiving and said I want you to write down what you're thankful for. Anybody get to do that? Anybody get to, to write that down and, and talk about that with people? I, I, I got to hear some of those things. You raise your hand, John. So we, we got to do some of those things at our dinner. Talk about what we're thankful for. Um, but your homework this week is not some handwritten thing. I don't want you to take a sheet of paper out. I want you to, to think about people that you might need to reconcile with. I, I know we're all here this morning, but you got to weep. Think about who you need to reconcile with. Is there someone that, that you're angry with? Somebody that did something to you? And, and I'm not saying wait for them to deserve your forgiveness. If Jesus is waiting for us to deserve his sacrifice, he will still be waiting. That doesn't work. Mercy is undeserved. Grace is undeserved. You don't sit there and wait for somebody to work for it. Is there somebody that deserves forgiveness this week? I mean, that, that you need to forgive this week whether they deserve it or not. Maybe you need to ask for forgiveness of something with someone else. So your homework this week is to think about those two situations and see if that, if that applies to you. And use the week to try to make that right. Be reconciled to that person. Then come back on Sunday, offer your sacrifice to God. Come here, sacrifice of praise. Come back here and enjoy being in the presence of God, who has forgiven all of us and continues to do it every day. We're not perfect. We, we still have our own faults. I'm very thankful that God doesn't keep that checklist and, and remind me of all my faults. So, there's your homework for this week. Jim, did you bring up our, our worship?